Yeah, yeah. So, like, from memory, was like you were on, you did an interview with NPR. Um, you did another interview recently as well. Um, what was it for Middle East Eye? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So people like reaching out to you. So I guess, mashallah, you know, you're making making waves uh, uh, <laughs> around the world, mashallah. So uh, what's your experience been like? What What have they, you know, sort of talked to you about and stuff like that? Um, so basically, there was a study done by Dr. Rani Awad with the Stanford um, Muslim Mental Health Lab, and the study showed that U.S. Muslims have um, basically had double the rate of suicide attempts as compared to any other faith, uh, you know, like Christianity or uh, faith group as, you know, Judaism, whatever. And um so that really uh, brings a lot of awareness. And so after that study came out, I was approached by several news outlets, such as NPR, Middle East Eye, and some other ones. And uh, just to get my perspective on um, suicide in the Muslim community and just general mental health in the Muslim community. Um, and because I have you know, my organization, SEMA, uh, where we try to educate and support and provide resources to Muslims in the Muslim community. Um, they wanted to kind of gain, you know, my perspective as someone who lived with someone with a mental illness. So, so yeah, well, it was a great opportunity. It's been great opportunities. It uh, gives a lot of awareness for, um, you know, this topic. And, um, inshallah you know it gets people the help that they need so yeah inshallah like uh, even just sad because you're talking about uh, suicide in the muslim community i actually had a good friend of mine that suicide recently not too long ago actually um played he was like my cricket captain and you know muslim bengali um and he yeah he suicide it was like a big shock because he was like you know kind of the jolly character um when i was like with him and so yeah like it's it's a it's a really deep discussion to have and in saying that i think a lot of it is also i guess there's different reasons obviously but you know a lot of it is also like pressure from the community like especially if you have um your parents like first generation coming to like in my context coming to australia you know they want to make sure that the kids do well um and the kids have to sort of do well you know through education etc work and all that and um yeah, and I think that pressure can be overwhelming at times. That pressure can be, um, you know, hard to to deal with, and as well as you know, navigating, you know, living in the West as a Muslim and faith and all this kind of stuff. It's it's not easy, you know. And so yeah, like when I had that friend, like um, had that situation uh, with my friend suiciding. That I don't know. It's been um, I actually dreamt of him recently. Like yeah, like things like that. It's really affecting um, people in in many ways because you know. You know, we, we need to, you know, protect, you know, our, our community. And, yeah, so that, that study came out. It was really interesting, the timing of that as well. So what's been your sort of, what, what would you sort of, um, when it comes to suicide in the, in the Muslim community, um, what do you think the reason is? Like what's been your sort of, uh, uh, when, you, when you sort of looked into it and your sort of side of things, what, what do you think um, has been the cause of that? Well, I don't think... Um... I mean, of course, more studies will have to be done to uh, find the source of it. But um, I don't think it's anything new. I think um, depression, I think the, the issue is that our community still has so much stigma. And we don't want to believe that uh, suicide and mental illness affects the, the Muslim community. You know, our community wants to project perfectionism and that oh if you follow you know islam to a t you would never be depressed you would never have any of these and that is not true if you look in the quran itself you know um uh Hazrat maryam you know um, she uh in the quran says you know when she's in the throes of labor she wishes for death she has suicidal ideation she says death would be better than this. And, you know, Allah, the angel Jabril, you know, comes and gives her cover. Allah did not chastise her. Allah did not shame her. He didn't say, no, you're uh, a 
pious person. How can you say things like this? No, he understood that she was afraid. I mean, just imagine the situation she's in. She's a young girl, a virgin, about to give birth. She's alone. And she's like, I'm going to have this baby and I'm going to have to face my community and, you know, all the stigma of a virgin girl having a child, you know, she would rather die. I mean, imagine today we are most pretty shames, you know, uh, children out of wedlock. Imagine those days, you know, uh, they probably would kill, you know, someone who a girl who had, you know, a baby out of wedlock, you know, so she was really uh in a moment of despair. And this is what happens when people are suicide. They are they are finally at the end of you know their hope and they're just completely full of despair. And uh yes, we have examples and there's even hadith about um uh there's a sahaba who um he migrated from Mecca to Medina an older man and you know he was missing his family he missed you know Mecca. he missed you know his old environment and he became depressed and he ended up um kind of like cutting off the fingertips you know tips of his fingers until he bled out and bled to death and uh, one of the other sahaba saw him in a dream and he was looking you know, he was wearing white and he was looking okay, but his hands were bandaged. And he's like, you know, what happened to you? And he said, um, Allah forgave me because I migrated for the sake of the Prophet. So uh, he said, and what, what of your hands? And he said, Allah did not return to me what I took from myself. And when he, the Sahaba told um, the Prophet, you know, about this dream, he said, yeah, he's, he's spoken the truth, you know, and so the, the, in the, the commentary on the hadith says that um, we can't say that uh, doing an act of disbelief, you know, a sin before your death takes you out of the fullness, that is unforgivable, you know, uh, only Allah can judge, we cannot judge. So, you know, we, and our community is always like, oh, um, suicide is from and i'm not trying to like uh kind of say i don't want to like condone it and say okay if anyone's who it's okay you might be forgiven no but you know only allah knows what what drives a person to that point and what their level of iman is who are we to say you know and i don't know if you remember even like a few years ago there was even like some videos of people at Hajj or Umrah, like jumping and like, you know, do you remember that? There was some videos like people like committing suicide at the Harab. And, um, you know, SubhanAllah is so disturbing and so sad, but, you know, what is driving these people? Uh, it's, it's just, it's just they're, you know, in, in part of not having hope could be that they're not getting that support from their families. Um, and that could be related to the stigma. The, the family isn't supportive of their depression. They don't know what to do when the person's having suicidal ideation. Um, they're not educated on how to, uh, support this person, get them the help that they need. So this person's left to their own devices and, uh, and, and then they end up, you know, just taking their own lives. It's, it's really, really, sad and yeah yeah like you touched on a really um good points especially for example uh co like this concept of like complaining to allah um is does um exist without without a uh, within our tradition in the sense of like if you're going through something uh you know hardships or depression and stuff you know you can kind of complain to allah but not to the point obviously to say like oh what you decreed upon me is like wrong. Like we don't want to fall into that kufur, but the whole idea of like expressing your um, sorrow or, or disappointment and all that is, is uh, and, and then, you know, sort of telling Allah to, you know, kind of alleviate you from the situation and right. all that sort of stuff and the circumstances you're going for. It's definitely like that concept definitely exists. And at times, yeah, like the whole idea of, oh, um, like we should be like as if whatever 
has been decreed. It's like, oh no, you can't even question it. You can't even say anything. You just have to accept it. Everything like that. It's like, you know, it, it doesn't give room to, you know, really express your feelings in any situation. And Allah knows your, you know, feelings and, and situations. And that's something that we have to kind of, you know, take on board as a community. And as, as you mentioned about um, suicide as well, sometimes we fixate on the sort of just, oh, suicide is haram and that's it. But there's no, there's no further conversation about, oh, what's driving people to suicide. Like it's about breaking it down. Like as Muslims and, you know, following the deen in Islam, we're meant to be smart, intellectual, think about things a bit deeper. Right. Um, and we need to unpack that conversation, but for some reason it's just, oh, suicide's haram. And that's it. That's like, that's it for that. Like the conversation seems to just end there and we need to like peel the layers, you know, back a little and it's like, okay, why is this happening? You know, what right. should we do as a community? So it's really important that we have that, you know, it's not even just like for suicide's fault, like most things, like for example, why does, um, I don't know, for, for example, like, you know, rape or kind of misconduct by Muslims, why does that happen in, in our communities, right? For some reason, it's like, oh, we, you know, if this was a Muslim state or something, we would punish the, the I don't know, the, the rapist or whatever. But that doesn't actually solve the issue. That doesn't actually address like why it's happening. We need to peel back the layers and unpack that and address that um, right. issue. So, yeah, like it comes down to, you know, really thinking things a bit deeper. And I think as a community, that's something that we really have to, you know, reflect upon and really think about. And I think even with you, you know, the sort of work that you're doing and even like, it's really interesting because, you know, we've had like a lot of conversations about narcissism, all that sort of stuff. Like even we had um, that um, clubhouse from a lot of people like um, turned up, mashallah. Like even those kind of conversations is like almost sidelined um, by some because it's like, oh, you know, like I give a, I give like a personal example in the, in the sense of, you know, you hear the classic, oh, I don't know, like children have to obey the, the, the parents or whatever. Right. And mm -hmm. it's like, that's conversation just ends there about the dynamics and of that and kind of navigating that. Um, and yeah, like people justify that kind of behavior using Islam, but there's actually a lot more to it. Right. And I think right. narcissism is a big conversation that needs to be um, sort of unpacked. So um, what's been your sort of experience? I know, you know, we've talked about it a lot, especially, um, you know, over the phone and we've had, you know, clubhouse rooms conducting this conversation, these type of conversations. So you, I, I know you've been sort of looking into it and researching it um, in your spare time and because you're doing the masters as well. Is that something you've sort of come up as well in, in your studies? Um, okay. So yeah, I am doing my master's in counseling psychology at Northwestern, alhamdulillah. Um, and SEMA kind of brought me, um, down that path i work in finance but uh but this is my passion i i i what so just to give like let's back up a little bit like about my my story and like my history with mental health and and how what brought me here and then we'll get into narcissism and and why i'm so intrigued by it so um you know i was born and raised in the u.s um grew up in a small town, Arkansas, and uh, uh, my family was not very religious. And um, my mother had severe mental illness, and her name was Seema. And um, it was, there was, this was, you know, 80s, 90s, and there was so much, you know, shame and stigma around mental illness. Uh, even her own diagnosis was uh, hidden from, you know, us children uh, at that time and you talked about um you know the the spiritual manipulation where or the cultural manipulation where you know oh it's your parents so so what happened um to me now i can look back and reflect on the patterns that were happening in the family dynamic and in the the intergenerational trauma that carried with me into adulthood um, so some of the, the patterns that I learned, so my mother, um, being sick, um, she sometimes, so she, she would get into like, what's called like psychotic psychosis. She would get into like psychotic fits at times. And, and, and those periods were very scary and traumatic to, uh, you know, experience and, and she would sometimes, um, get, you know, violent and either with us or with the uh, other adults in the house or, uh, and sometimes suicidal with herself as well. 
And um, as a child, one of the messages that you get uh, when someone is, you know, intermittent love and then they're abusive is that, oh, love is pain. And this is normal. That the person who's supposed to protect me and nurture me also hurts me. You know, and and we we because of the shame and stigma again, the other adults in the home were not explaining to us that you know the difference that this is she's just sick, this is not normal. Don't ex you shouldn't accept this as normal, you know? But we accept it as normal, right? Second thing is that um, you know we should manage other people's emotions. So because she was so sick, everyone was so focused on her. This is where codependency comes in. We'll talk about that a little bit. But um, so as a child, our emotions and feelings were neglected and everyone was just focused on my mother and her feelings and moods and emotions. And so we were always watching her kind of walking on eggshells, afraid to set, trigger her, set her off, you know, make her upset. So we're always just managing her and not managing ourselves right uh just just other focused um another thing that we were taught as children because of her was to keep secrets you know because of the shame and stigma we were told um not to tell anyone what was happening in the home you know so i would go to school and i would you know even okay the night before she would have a psychotic fit she would kick us out of the house until you know 2, 3 a.m., then we would have to sneak back into the house because she would literally lock us out. Um, we had what's called a doggy door from outside into the garage, and I was so small, I would crawl in and then, you know, unlock the, the, the doors. When, when she We would watch from the windows and see if she fell asleep, and then I would sneak everyone back into the house, you know, the other adults, my grandparents and whatnot, and my sisters. So, um, so... And then we'd have to wake up for school, you know, just a few hours later and act like nothing happened and, you know, put a smile on and, you know, I'm, you know, just keep secrets. And um, so, you know, and then the fourth thing uh, is, um, you know, the cultural or spiritual manipulation um, where, you know, obey your parents, uh, your mother, your mother, your mother. You can't say oof to your parents. So, you know, this all this is happening and we could not, um, you know, uh, express our frustration, you know, or our displeasure with uh, our mother, you know. Uh, so, and so, you know, we can talk about um, – um, that and then what happens with someone like that? Okay, with, with so two things can happen: the children are traumatized, and they can either uh, become, and this can fall into narcissism as well. But um, but they can either become, uh, you know, bullies or or oppressors themselves, or they can become the oppressed when they're in this type of situation, right? And so what happens with intergenerational trauma is a child that's gone through something like this, let's say they get married, and they find themselves in a, uh, with an abusive spouse. So the same messaging that they have gotten as a child, uh, love is pain, the person who's supposed to protect me and, and maintain me also hurts me, becomes familiar and normal. Um, you know, manage the other person's moods, you know, so the spouse is, has, is anger prone and abusive, you know, so they're always, you know, trying to please them and, okay, you know, I need to um, not say anything to anger my spouse, whatever. So they become, you know, kind of submissive in that way. Um, keeping secrets, they don't tell anyone that their spouse, you know, is being abusive. And, and, and then the, the, if it's a uh, male and female, if I, I'm, I work a lot with the single women demographic. So I work with a lot of domestic abuse victims. So 
So I'm going to speak from a female perspective, but not to say that women can't be abusive, that that, that does happen. Of course, uh, it's less for men to be abused, but it does happen. I think it's one in seven men are abused by a, a, a wife, a, a domestic abuse, but uh, w women is much lower. I think one in four. Um, so anyway, so... Um, so in, in those situations, you know, the spiritual manipulation is, you know, you must obey your husband. You can't say no to your husband in the bedroom or the angels will curse you. Um, there's some hadith that are thrown around about, you know, after Allah, you, you do suju to your husband, you know, and all of these are taken out of context, you know, like what it, and, that hadith in particular is actually, uh, I spoke to a, a scholar about this, and, and that hadith is more for the men than for the women. The hadith is to tell the men that you have to uphold yourself in such a manner. You know, you have to be at such a level of, of piety for your wife to give you that kind of respect, you know, and obedience. Not that you are just because you're born a man, you have a God-given right of respect, you know, and that you can raise your hand. And, you know, that's not what that hadith is about, you know. So these things are taken out of context. And um, you see victims, you know, uh, of, of abuse, you know, why did they stay? Well, it was familiar to them. They were, they, they got this psychological subconscious messaging from childhood, this is where the intergenerational trauma comes in. And and then what they're doing is uh, continuing that cycle with their own children. So now their children um, have gotten similar messaging and then they grow up and then they get married and then they accept it, you know, so until someone stops the abuse, and, you know, and there's hadith about, um, where the process I'm told was telling the Sabbaths, he's like, you know, you have to help the oppressed and help the oppressor. And they said, you know, how do you help the oppressor? And he said, by stopping them. And so, you know, what happens with people who are codependent is in fact, they're essentially enablers. Uh, they are so, you know, attached to this their trauma bond what is called a trauma bond <clears throat> so what happens in the trauma bond is um so again let's talk about the messaging that you get or what's happening as a child right so you're being abused as a child you're getting intermittent um love and then intermittent abuse right so the child wants the love from their parents and um so when the parent becomes abusive they want that the nice loving parent to come back right so they develop what's called like a, a i mean it's it's a chemical addiction right uh and so that's the trauma bond so then when they are with an abusive partner um you know they're having good times you know because abuse is not it's very it's not linear it's They'll, they'll be nice sometimes and then they'll be abusive sometimes, right? And, and they keep their victims in that insecure state of you don't know what's going to, what's coming next. Maybe today I'm going to be in a good mood. Maybe today I'm not going to be in a good mood, right? So when everything will be fine, let's say for a few days and then, and then the spouse gets angry and abusive, uh, you know, maybe emotionally abusive, verbally abusive. And then this, the, the victim starts missing, you know, their abuser and saying after, after they've been, you know, horribly, you know, torn down, like you're, you're a terrible person. I hate you. I, I'm going to leave you, you know, all these horrible things that the abuser might say to them. And then they, they, they maybe go into separate rooms or whatever the victim will suddenly feel this urge of, I need to go back to the, the my partner and make things better. I need to, I this pain is so um, 
strong. I need this pain to go away. And the way I can make the pain go away is to seek comfort from the same person who just abused me. How, like, how does that make any sense? Right? Mm. So you're enabling. I've got something to add. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I got something to add as well. Um, just like, because, you know, we've had these kind of conversations um, over the phone and in the past. And because I brought, I bring the sort of four temperaments perspective as well. It's really fascinating that, like, that also reminds me of like Stockholm syndrome a bit. I reckon it's some, oh, yeah. maybe some chemicals firing in the brain. It's similar. I Absolutely. think it, there's some parallels there, which is fascinating. But even just like from that perspective, that the person wants to go back to, you know, the spouse or whatever, even though the spouse is mistreating them in such a manner. Um, to take the uh, four temperaments perspective, uh, essentially there's the phlegmatic temperament, the water temperament that is very uh, emotionally intelligent, always wants to make sure every, everyone around them is happy and in, in good spirits and puts uh, uh, others above, uh, above themselves. Um, and th- that, that sort of, um, that's natural to them in their sort of outlook of life. And so in that kind of dynamic, what actually essentially happens is that they'll actually almost, because they know that, their spouse is upset, even though that they mistreated them, the fact that the spouse is upset, angry, etc., it's like they'll still have that natural disposition or inclination to make sure they're happy and fine. And yeah. so they'll sort of still go back to them and try to please them as much as possible. And the the sort of spouse at the um, the the one that's you know abusive, etc., will use that to his advantage or her advantage, whatever. But oh, yeah. in this case, just say it's a he. Like they know that they have the other spouse by you know by thread right and so it's like playing with their emotions so it's like they haven't all the control of this kind of dynamic of this um relationship so it's really fascinating like it's just that i think a lot of people just aren't aware like people you know already assume the best of everyone which is like like in in a good way it's like i guess it's not like un-islamic right but in saying that it's like it people need to be aware about all this sorry i'll let you continue as well i also wanted to give that um perspective and lens as well to that dynamic yeah so um i've also um tried to look at this from an islamic psychology perspective right so what happens with these victims a lot of times is they are in despair right they're they are hopeless um they're just like especially when um the community the the culture that a lot of uh, these victims are in the 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 the, the cultural um, pressures, the societal pressures is, you know, sabr in tawakal, you know, have sabr, have tawakal, you know, you know, and, and they tell women you're nothing if you're not married, you know, you 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 without a spouse, you know, what are, what do you have to live for, kind of thing. So so women, you know, feel like this pressure, like okay, I'm. This is the the cards I've been dealt, and I have to have sabr, and I have to make the most of it. But their iman is so broken because they're like, why did Allah, why has Allah written this for me? Uh, is he punishing me? Is is did I do something wrong and he is upset? And so now I just have this is what you know, my, my qadr, you know, my fate is I have to live in this oppressed state. Now, this is where we get messed up. Okay. So oppression is the antithesis of Islam, right? All over the Quran is all about the opposite of oppression. I mean, we don't want anyone to be oppressed, right? And Allah does not want us to be oppressed. And when it comes to mental health, you know, when you're in this kind of situation, a lot of these uh, people who are in these uh, oppressed uh, uh, marriages, they are experiencing uh, depression or anxiety or, you know, they're, they're, they're definitely anxious because they don't know what they're going to get today. You know, is today going to be a good day? Or is today going to be, you know, hard? going to get hit today am i going to be yelled at today am i going to be you know verbally assaulted to you know whatever so they are always on on edge in this state of anxiety and then you know a, a sense of hopelessness and depression and allah the islam means peace you know and allah wants us in the state of calmness peace serenity um and, and your spouse is supposed to give you that that's that they should be a source of comfort for you, not a source of pain for you. And 
So when you're in this state uh, and you know what's right and wrong, right? We know right, we know what our spouse is doing is, is wrong, um, but we allow the, the spouse to gaslight us and we in turn gaslight ourselves and stay in the state and we think less of our Lord, right? We think less of our Lord by saying, oh, maybe this is what he wanted for me. He doesn't love me. He's abandoned me. But in, in, the reality is we have abandoned ourselves. By abandoning ourselves, we've abandoned Allah. Does that make sense? Your gut feeling, Allah is, Allah is, is you know, there's, I'm learning a, a bit, I've, I, I've joined um, the board of advisors for uh, international students of Islamic psychology. We talk about a lot of these things and, and you know, the, the this is a little bit Sufism, but there, I think I'm learning so much. I've, there's definitely a connection. So there's the, the aqal, your mind, there's the qalb, your heart, the ruh, your soul, and then there's the nafs. And it is all connected. And if you are just in your head and you're not listening to your gut, your, your fitra, your nafs, your, your soul, you know, your ruh, you know, that's speaking to your qalb, you know, all these things are interconnected. And if you are disconnected from that, then yes, you're going to feel a disconnection from Allah. And, um, yeah, so, so, so there's definitely a, uh, you know, some correlation, um, between abandoning ourselves, you know, and, and what our, our gut is telling us, um, that this, something's wrong here. This is not normal. I should get out of this, but I'm not. And I, no, I'm just going to ignore those feelings and, and so what ends up happening is um, these victims, they put pleasing their spouse over pleasing Allah. They, so when Allah is telling us in the Quran, I'm no alama, you know, but these are little things I've learned, right? When Allah is telling us to attach our hearts to him, that this dunya is going to confuse us and make us attached to money to our children to love to whatever right uh this is what Allah's talking about um a lot of times we attach ourselves to our spouses even though they are pressing us we we allow Allah's creation to come between us and our creator and and, and one of the ayat of uh, in, in Surah Talaq, I think it's the third ayat, um, Allah's telling, you know, us in that ayat about um, having the wakil, that he will provide. And I think a lot of, um, you know, women in these situations um, are dependent, you know, on their spouse. Some, some women don't work, you know, they're financially dependent, they're emotionally dependent, whatever it is. And they are, they don't, they're, they don't feel that they have what it takes to leave the marriage and stand on their own two feet. But that's where they lose their tawakal, you know, and, and trust that Allah will provide, Allah will take care of them out of ways that they can't even imagine, you know, and, and, and vice versa. Of course, I'm all, I'm speaking from the female perspective because um, that's the demographic I work with, but uh um, but yeah, I mean, these are things that we have to, like you said, you have to peel the layers. Why is someone not praying? A woman who's in this joy, why is she not praying anymore? Why is she not, you know, keeping up with her ibadah? Why is she feeling disconnected from Allah? Well, what's going on? You know, let's look at the whole picture and what's happening. And, and, um, a lot of times these women, they say once they're divorced, like their connection with Allah is like, a, another level, you know, they're, they're the local, everything has come back and, and they're like, I know I made the right decision because, um, I have a law back in my life, you know, so subhanAllah, it's, uh, really, really interesting. You know, that I like to tell people that this, this life is a love story between us and Allah. Our destination is not Jannah. Our destination is Allah connecting with Allah, getting back to and um, yeah, it's, uh, 
I mean, people still, some people still have hardships even, you know, and, and it, Allah tests those whom he loves even after they get out of that situation, they're still tested and, and, um, but, but it's a test of their faith. And, and, um, a lot of times they're able to just, just to ask, um, just, just to ask as well, um, cause you know, Marshall, you brought some really, you know, amazing insights in regards to connection of Allah and all that, as well as also linking it with, um, you know, spousal relationships. I just want to ask you a bit more specific question regard, cause since we were on like within, um, I guess dynamic within, you know, marriage situation or relationship situation, how would you say, like, for example, <clears throat> when it comes to narcissism, in what ways does narcissism manifest within, it could be, a, to be honest, it could be even marriage situation, <clears throat> it could be a, a dating situation, like in what ways will we see it manifest? Okay, so let's get into narcissism. So first of all, there's a difference between narcissistic traits and pathological narcissism, okay? So, you know, narcissism itself is on a spectrum and people, everyone has a little bit of narcissism in them and there is good narcissism as well. It's not all bad, you know, it's good to have a sense of self-worth, a sense, have some self-esteem. It, it gives you confidence, you know, um, there, that stuff is good. It's when it becomes pathological is when it becomes a problem, right? And when you, so, so, so some of the criteria for what's called narcissistic personality disorder in the DSM, um, uh, I'll give you some of those. Um, so you have a pervasive pattern of um, grandiosity. You know, they think that they're uh, bigger than themselves, that they're the greatest thing. Um, they, they have um, dreams of, you know, Ha running big organizations or, you know, uh, running the country, you know, we have some examples of, you know, some leaders that are like that. They have a strong need for admiration. That's another sign. So you have to have five of these nine symptoms, okay? A strong need for admiration. Um, they, they have fantasies of power, success, beauty, or an idealized vision of love. Um, they have a sense of entitlement. Um, they have a belief of being special, uh, unique, or high status. Um, they lack empathy in others. Um, <clears throat> that's a that's a big one. Um, kind of selfish in a way. Um, they have a tendency to exploit others, and they have very arrogant behavior. So if, if someone is displaying at least five of these symptoms, uh, they could be diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder. Now, I, the, only like one in 200 people are diagnosed with it. That's like about 7% of men and about 4.8% of women, almost 8% of men. And, um, but it doesn't mean that people aren't walking around with, NPD and aren't diagnosed, you know? So, so there's a difference also. There's two kinds of, uh, narcissism. There's, um, two in coin. There's overt narcissists, uh, which, which I would call the wolves in wolves clothing. Like you can spot them in a room. They're compulsively trying to attract attention to themselves. They're demanding admiration. They're very charming. Um, they're, they like to flatter people and they're trying to impress people. Uh, they're very arrogant. Um, they tend to give in to rages, you know, physical violence. Um, they view other people as competition. Uh, they're trying to one up people. They ridicule, mock, and degrade other people. Um, they show a sense of entitlement and you, you, you can probably think of people that you've seen that kind of exhibit these behaviors. So that's overt. The covert are really scary because yeah, they're not going to lie. Huh? You, you <laughs> covert are very difficult. <laughs> not lie. Yeah. Covert though, are very difficult to spot. And I'll say a lot of these coverts are running a lot of our Muslim organizations. It's kind of scary. 
um, they come into these, you know, uh, positions of leadership. And so o covert are wolves in sheep's clothing. Okay. Um, and I've seen all, I've seen both of these. I've, I've many examples, subhanAllah. Uh, I, this is what kind of drew me is, um, well, we'll talk about that, but, um, Okay, so they they come off as very shy, very vulnerable. You know, they'll be self um, efficacy Like they'll they'll be like, oh, I'm I'm not nothing. I'm very you know act very humble. Oh, I'm nobody. I'm I'm nothing. You know, um, whatever. And um, and then they're also kind of fishing for compliments from you. Like, no, oh my God, you're so amazing. You know, um, they're expert liars and manipulators. Uh, they appear to be very loving and giving and altruistic and um, very loyal. They're very kind in public, but in private, you know, they're deeply selfish uh, and, and entitled. Um, they will sometimes exaggerate suffering and sickness to get some sympathy from others. Um, they have delusions of being victims and being persecuted by people around them. Uh, they seek out both types. They they both seek out uh, caretaker type personalities to exploit them. You know, so codependents and empaths are definite targets of narcissists. Um, they're they're both very hypersensitive to perceived criticism. Uh, if you try to give them any type of constructive criticism, it, this, even a jokingly, they will be like. <gasps> Oh my gosh, I can't believe you said that to me. Like, oh, I'm such a loser, you know. Wow. And you're like, no, I was joking. Like, what are you talking about? It was no, I didn't mean to hurt you. Like, you know, it, you'll kind of be like, wow, that was a really strong reaction to something. Like you know, like walking simple. on eggshell, like walking on eggshells and Yeah, you should always be praising on them. all the time. Always be praising that you can never joke with them. You can't, you know insult them at all you know um or criticize them at all you know they use a lot of passive aggressive manipulation tactics um they'll cry on cue um and manipulate through self-pitting performances there was um i there was a brother who uh i know of and he would cry all the time um like I've never even met a woman who cries this much, you know? And um, I, I was like, oh, maybe this person is just a very sensitive person. But later, after some time, I came to see that they were a covert narcissist and, and this was, uh, you know, one of their, their manipulation tactics, right? They stage a crisis to gain attention. They will blame all of their problems and failures on unfair people, institutions, circumstances, and they emotionally drain their partner and their family. Um, you know, they are emotional manipulators. And so what I've seen is a lot of times um, these uh, narcissists have co what's called a comorbidity. What a comorbidity is, is when you have uh, multiple uh, mental illnesses coca current right so i'll see a narcissist you know have depression anxiety they might have bipolar disorder they might have substance use disorders addictions um eating disorders and it can co-occur with other cluster b personality disorders such as borderline personality disorder paranoid personality disorder antisocial personality disorder um so you might think, oh, the person's depressed or, you know, they have anger issues. And, and mind you, uh, depression uh, in women, in both, but usually in men, depression can present itself as anger. Um, so men tend to externalize their emotions. Women tend to internalize, you know, their emotions. And in, for women, it kind of uh, presents itself as, you know, they, they develop, you know, illnesses and whatnot because they're internalizing. But um, men tend to externalize their anger, frustration, their sadness, whatever, as in this way. And so, um, so, so when we talk about, you know, narcissism in families, you know, what you see 
is one parent, and I've seen this as well. I've I have seen a, a narcissist family, you know, in close proximity. So I have a lot of experience with this. So one parent who's not, and, and, and it can be the male or the female. I've seen it where the female is the narcissistic parent, okay? And that narcissistic parent is very, you know, controlling. Um, they're very emotionally uh, and maybe even physically abusive and manipulative. Um, they will emotionally be neglectful. Um, they they tend to enmesh with their children. See, narcissists see children as an extension of themselves. They do not see their children as in, in individuals with their own thoughts and feelings. No, they are an extension of themselves. Um, the narcissistic parent is very emotionally unstable. Um, they can be very demanding, um, delusional. You know, they put their own needs ahead of the needs of their children. And and the spouse typically ends up becoming a codependent. So a codependent person is someone who um, is an enabler, as I mentioned before. They're very compliant. They clean up the, the drama and the messes that the narcissist creates. Um, they're, they are also avoiding attack from the narcissist and they're seeking rewards such as affection, praise, money, whatever. Um, and they they are trauma bonded to their narcissistic partner, and and they have that chemical addiction of intermittent love and abuse cycles with that partner. And um, you know they spend a lot of their own emotional resources trying to please that narcissistic partner, and they in turn might inadvertently emotionally neglect their children as well. So now the children are emotionally neglected, not only by the narcissist parent, but even the codependent parent, the one who's supposed to be healthy and stable. And then you've got other characters, the narcissist family system, they'll turn some of the kids into um, flying monkeys, you know, so flying monkeys are um, the children or the relatives that enable the narcissist to control and abuse others and um, they will kind of pit them against each other and say you know oh you know manipulate and say kind of uh gang up on you know whoever their victim is um they'll maybe make one child the golden child their their idealized favorite child and and you know they'll boast about this child's achievements as if it's their own you know achievement and it, it boosts their own ego like oh look at all these great achievements my child has done in uh you know and then um the scapegoat is the child who or a relative somebody in the family who recognizes all the injustices in the family system and they benefit the least from it oh they become like the the enemy of the narcissist because they call them out on their B, their bs you know so some of the manipulation tactics that um, narcissists use. Do you have any questions before I get into that? Um, so like even with, I don't know about uh, questions, but just, I guess, comments as well. It's really interesting that you talked about, for example, the golden child perspective, because we see, especially like within my own community, where you know much like in a good way like education is really valued and you know for the right reasons but at the same time it's like you see behaviors from certain parents where it's like they will make sure the kid you know has uh, i guess from from the outside looking in it's like yeah you know they're trying to provide the best for the kids etc but it comes at the cost but the real underlying uh purpose to that is because they want to show off to other aunties and uncles around and it comes at the cost of the actual child you know themselves like the child doesn't have like you know a, a sporting kind of a life doesn't have i don't know um you know a normal kind of childhood whereas it's like since their parents want to prove to other parents that their kid is better than theirs and sort of uh, show off that they are better than other parents they all kind of make sure the kid is only studying etc and comes like the cost of mental health and having like a normal kind of healthy balanced um life of a child and it kind of fosters that kind of uh, community of, of narcissistic um, tendencies and behaviors. So I think that's one thing to keep in mind as well, that making sure that, as you mentioned um, previously, sometimes a narcissist will kind of do everything at, at the expense of the of the child's um, feelings and, and situations and, you know, making them feel uh, like a human, normal human being. And, uh, you know, it's about making sure that we provide what's best for the child 
uh, within our means as well. So I just wanted to highlight yeah, that. Yeah, that no, well, that's a really good, good point that you brought up. With, yeah, uh, that is a good point. I've seen an example where there was a this kind of family system, and there was um, a boy. I think it was the eldest child, and he was, um, you know, supposed to. The, the parents wanted him to go to med school and whatever. And he had so much fear of disappointing the narcissistic parent. He lied and hid that he actually didn't get in, but he told them he had. And he was pretending to go to classes. He even got married <laughs> under the pretense that he was in med school and, and hiding from his spouse that he was going and attending classes and whatnot. And, Oh my goodness, like crazy the, 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 the extent that these children who are under this oppression, you know, of the narcissistic parent will go to, you know, lying themselves because they're afraid. I mean, that's in, and, and then get messing up other people's lives, getting married, messing up your spouse's life, you know, cause you're just in that much fear. It's, it's crazy anyway. So some of the manipulation tactics uh, that yeah. uh, narcissists use, I like to call FOG, okay? They control you with the acronym FOG, F for fear, O for obligation, and G with guilt. So if you are a victim of a narcissist, you know, you're being controlled by the, the fear of their wrath, their anger, right? They also control you with obligation. Well, you have to obey me. You're my child. You're my spouse. You know, <clears throat> you're you're not a good Muslim, and that that feeds into the guilt of, that the victim has. Like, oh, uh, if I don't obey them, I'm not being a good Muslim. Allah's not going to be happy with me, or or I I can't break ties with my family. Just, even when uh, one one comment. One, one comment I wanted to quickly make because you like this point because you mentioned it um, earlier as well um, in regards to latching onto aspects about Deen and Islam to make a point like I don't know like if you don't go to bed with me angels will curse you to the jail judgment so, like that kind of latching onto it's like only narcissists like I think like I just wanted to make it clear why sorry why I interrupted it's like I just want to make it clear I guess even to the listeners it's like narcissists will only latch onto that aspects to coerce him to doing something right like if yes. you have a loving kind of relationship thing you'll do each uh you know loving things for each other you know out of love it's not like you need to like force someone use aspects about being to strategically get what you want like that's like such a weird and horrible dynamic to have so yeah. it's not a normal kind of behavior so it's something to be you know aware of as well it's like only a narcissist will do that that they'll lash on to aspects of dean you know like so yeah. right right to control and manipulate um so another thing they use is gaslighting so gaslighting is um where they kind of make you uh, question your own perception of reality you're like am i crazy like that did happen and they'll be like no i never said that that never happened you know they'll deny they'll dismiss they'll distort you know they'll lie you know just to erode your own judgment you know uh in sense of reality and uh, so that's what gaslighting is. And it, and what ends up happening, I think, a lot of times is, as I said before, the victim will end up gaslighting themselves just to because they're in that, that survival mode. And they're like, okay, well, it wasn't that bad. You know, the, the abuse wasn't, at least the person didn't break any bones. At least the person um, didn't make, leave any bruises on me, for example. No, you know abuse is abuse you know if they're hurting you if they're hitting you pushing you kicking you choking you whatever just because they're not leaving marks or breaking anything doesn't mean it's okay you know uh, and i think that 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 messaging needs to be very clear that if someone is physically abusing you, get out you know don't don't have husan done you know we talk about husan done with these people um you know, there's a limit to Husn al uh, There was some sister I was talking to about Husn al You know, Husn al is where you kind of make excuses for the person. You you say, no, there, there, there might be some reason why they're behaving this way. You're, you're just trying to, you know, uh, think well of the person, right? 
But what happens is um, when you have too much husland, then, then it turns into bitterness and resentment. And, and that is not good either. You know, uh, you don't want to get to that level where now you hate the person and, you know, it gets to the flip side, you know. So <clears throat> there's always a limit to these things. Um, another form of manipulation is projection, you know. So just if they're to, uh, cheating. Just to add yeah. as well, sorry, before, before we jump on to before we uh, jump onto that point, like just add to gaslighting as well. Um, sorry, I know I'm going to add in bits and bobs because I just want to okay. give also from the temperament perspective as well. Um, yeah, so like with um, gaslighting as well, what happens is um, one particular temperament that may be susceptible to being gaslit is um, the phlegmatic water temperament is because mostly uh, how they perceive and think things is that they'll overthink situations. They will think, think, think. And sometimes they think so much that they're less lost in their own thoughts, etc. So that's like one of the things that is more natural to the water temperament compared to the other temperaments. And so within that, these people become more susceptible. It's because like if if someone, if um, for example, the water temperament spouse says, you know, uh, you know, I think you did this, and then the other spouse is like, no, I didn't. And then you start thinking, wait, did did they? Okay, maybe they didn't. And then you just kind of think about like. 20 other reasons that potentially didn't actually happen. And so that's why, you know, they're more susceptible to that happening to them. So it's just mm -hmm. about just being self-aware as well. Is that if you have that kind of, uh, you know, disposition to think in that manner, just be aware of it and catch yourself and just be confident in what you feel and think of a certain thing in that moment and be confident in it rather than getting lost in your thoughts. Because if once you get lost in your thoughts, you can kind of think reasons of as to, wait, I might be wrong, he's right, um, or they're right, and that's it. And, and, and you kind of let you, um, and they, they, you just become gaslit all the time, basically, because you're more susceptible to, to that kind of thoughts and, and behavior. So I just wanted to also make that kind of side of things um, aware as well um, from the yeah, perspective. Yeah. And when you, and when you mentioned um, gaslit, I think you mentioned something else I uh, forgot because I had something add, um, to add. Um, when you're talking about gas, getting gaslit and then you were talking about something else, I forgot. I said, I said the um, victim also gaslights themselves. Okay, yeah. Yeah, okay, so I just wanted to add that point, but yeah, sorry, go on about... Um, okay, you, you had the so another point. form um, uh, of manipulation is they, they project, you know? So they might be cheating on you, right? But they will constantly be um, accusing the spouse of cheating because they themselves, they know what they're up to. Um, or, if, or if they lie, they'll constantly be accusing... Oh, the other people of lying, you know, um, you know, if, if, if they're demanding reassurance, they'll accuse you of being insecure, but even though they're insecure. So, so that projection, you know, is happening. Um, you know, we're, I'm just thinking like, I, I can imagine if I haven't been in this position, but, uh, if someone was like accusing you of cheating, cheating and you're like what like why would you maybe i'm thinking maybe they would want to like check your phone you know they're checking your emails or something i don't know i'm, I'm just wondering like how how that you know and they are probably keeping their phones locked and and being very secretive with their own stuff you know uh, i can imagine but uh, uh another oh this is a big one well a couple of them you know what i'm gonna I'll, I'll skip this. I'll, okay, so hoovering, hoovering is another one. So, so whenever the victim's trying to set boundaries or they try to go no contact, um, the narcissist will try to suck them back in. You know, they'll they'll try messaging them, um, you know, texting them or emailing them or uh, or even if they're in the same home, you know, they could be, um, you know, trying to talk to them like, oh, you know. Do you want to go eat something? Do you want to go to dinner? You know, and when that person's trying to set a boundary and like, I need space, I need to get away from you for now, you know, they're trying to get you back into that, their, 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 the playpen, the, the ring pen, you know, uh, the boxing match, you know, they want to get you back in. So they, that's called hoovering. Okay. Now these two things are kind of, um, together. Okay. So narcissists need something that's called narcissistic supply. Okay, they are highly dependent on other people to give them emotional sustenance and validation. 
Um, they demand attention, agreement, adoration. It could be relatives, friends, court. So, so you see a lot of these um, even on social media, for example, um, where they are getting a lot of attention, uh, you know, adoration from fans. Um, so that's narcissist supply. And then tied to that is something called triangulation. Uh, and what I've seen is, there, you know, is sometimes it's hard to differentiate a womanizer from a narcissist. Uh, so you have to look at all the patterns of behavior. So, so imagine like, uh, and, and I'm not saying I, I'm using the word womanizer. I mean, women definitely do this as well, uh, where they use men, you know, for different reasons, you know. Um, but what I've seen is, you know, we we call them players or womanizers or whatever. And uh, they might be in a relationship, but they have um, other women that they talk to as friends or, or other men that they talk to as friends who are stroking their ego, you know, telling them that they're so wonderful, um, you know, just giving them that, that supply that they need. Um, so I see non, I have an example of a non-Muslim. I had someone I, that I was working with um, was in a relationship with the narcissist. And he was, you know, he had so many women that he would rotate and go sleep around, you know. He was having intimate relations with multiple women and would tell this woman, you know, that she was crazy, she was imagining things, you know. And uh, it's just even his ex-wife he would go back to his ex-wife's house and oh i need to help her she's sick i need to help her paint or do this thing around her house like always keeping their supply they cannot they don't let any of their they had to keep tabs on everybody and they 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 get a little um they could even get like a little stalkerish or they, they're very possessive with their supply you know so um so what another thing they use is triangulation so triangulation is where um it, you can see in different ways you can see it like in family systems where people will pit against each other but where i've seen it in relationships is they'll be like um uh talking about a third person bringing a third person into the relationship by talking about them um so uh imagine you know you're in a relationship okay let's let's flip the switch uh let's say the narcissist is a woman and and you're a man and you're in a relationship with this woman and she has a friend some brother you know that she works with in the community and she's like, oh, he is so great. Oh, he, you know, this is how he, he's so good to, um, in the community, he, you know, he's so giving, he's so sweet, he's so kind, he's so, why are you talking about this other person? Why are you comparing me to, you know, they're trying to make you feel insecure, they're comparing you to that person, trying to get you to behave like that person so they can get what they want out of you and make you feel insecure, you know, um, so that kind of triangulation, um, um, I've seen it where um, uh, I had some sisters talk about their spouses talking about second wives. So an imaginary third person. So they, they're married to a narcissist and the narcissist will constantly threaten their wives that, oh, if you don't behave, if you don't do this for me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get another wife. I'm going to get a second wife. So, so what they're doing is they're feeding on their victims' fears of abandonment and, and creating that insecurity. I mean, do you think, do you really think the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would use polygamy to so, instill fear in his wives that I'm going to leave you, I'll get another one. If you don't behave, I'm going to get another one. Staghfirullah, right? But this is, I've seen so many yeah. examples of this. this is, this is not what, you know, uh, polygamy is to raise the status of women, not to degrade them, you know, and, and, and also to raise the status of those other wives, you know, not to 
they're not supposed to be seen as objects uh, to be used, you know, for sexual pleasure and whatnot. I mean, I'm getting into another topic in itself, but, um, you know, this is what's happening is, you know, people in our community are, um, because of porn addictions and whatever, they're starting to objectify women and, and they look at them as um, something that is, the women are just there for their pleasure. No, we are here to, to worship a lot, just like you. We are here to um, be the best Muslims that we can be. We have feelings and emotions too, you know. Um, we are not here just for your pleasure. We're here to please Allah, you know. And a good husband will honor that, you know, that this woman is also striving to, you know, get to Allah and I have to respect her, you know, on that level. So, so anyway, so, and then the last, um, manipulation tattoo is narcissistic rage, you know? So when the way you see that in overt narcissist, you know, screaming, threats, physical violence, and covert, you see like passive aggressive behavior, stonewalling, silent treatments, guilt tripping. Um, and, um, you know, I've done some research about what scholars have had to say about narcissists. You know, Allah has described to us, and Allahu Alam, Allah knows best, but Allah has described uh, to us who the munafiqeen are. And there's some um, publications that I've read that have, you know, the, the, the four signs of a munafiq, three or four signs, you know, when when they're given a promise they break it um when they're given a tr uh, or when they when they speak they lie when they are given a promise or an amana they they break it and when they argue or fight they go really low and use vulgar language you know and and we see that and these people think about it at the time of the prophet Sallam, these people prayed they fasted, they look like upstanding, um, you know, community members, but they were munafikin, right? And, and the way Allah describes um, the munafikin in the Quran, he says, you know, they, when they, their words, you know, and he's telling the Prophet, because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi also uh, didn't know how to recognize these people at times, you know, and he, and he would also get caught up in their speech. You know, when they speak, you get caught up in their speak, their, their, their adornment, the way they dress. They, they just look like very respectable, you know, upstanding people. And when they speak, they're so eloquent in their speech and, and all these things. And, you know, so, so, you know, we could go on and on. I mean, I, we can go back to you know the narcissistic family but i want to talk about how to spot a narcissist and some of the things that i've learned um and this can be in relationships this can be in business trans any anything right so there's there's a cycle that narcissists go through okay so the cycle is love bombing devalue discard okay this is the cycle of a narcissist so in the love bombing stage, now this could be, you know, Tianzin, this could be you and some covert narcissist in the Muslim community and running some organization you're working with, right? So so the love bombing stage, or, and, and again, this could be in a relationship, a, a romantic relationship. So in the love bombing stage, you know, praise, oh my God, you're so awesome. Wow, you got this podcast, you're so cool, you're so great. Wow, mashallah, you're how old and you've already accomplished <laughs> all these things. Wow, you're so mashallah. You know, you're yeah, so what amazing. What, <laughs> what 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 can I say? Thank you. <laughs> um, so over flattery, you know, over praise, um, these kinds of things. Um, um, and then um uh if you're in a relationship, you know, texting a lot, you know, I've seen um especially, you know, with these apps and stuff, you're, you're meeting people and, you know, they, from good morning to good night, you know, they're, they're texting you all day long, um, from the morning till night, you know, giving you a lot of attention, right? Um, praise, attention, gift giving, you know, they might shower you with gifts and, and, uh, they, they figure out what you're, 
what your uh, weakness is, you know, where they can, you know, come and love bomb you, you know. And, and I've seen, so, so narcissists in the relationships, they move very fast. You know, they will try to get married within a week. You know, they'll be proposing marriage within a week, getting married within two weeks, you know, um, to kind of trap their victim. Because think about it. You know, this is not healthy and this is not normal. You know, the problem in our Muslim community is we, we, we're like, oh, you should get married. You shouldn't waste time and whatever. But no, it takes time to, you, you don't become best friends with somebody overnight, right? Your best friend, I don't know who your best friend is. But I know you've got the Josh and Raf, you know, you guys probably didn't become best friends overnight. No, it took I thought, time. I thought we were best friends. Okay, you and I are best friends, right? So <laughs> <laughs> it, it wasn't overnight. Like, you, it takes time. You build a friendship over time. You build trust. Um, you know, you, you hang out. We never hung out. We're in different countries. But you know what I mean? You, like, you slowly build, you know, a relationship over time. Um, so same with a lover, like an intimate relationship. Uh, it can't happen overnight. You know, it, you, it takes time. You have to sit back and observe. Um, I'm going to talk about, uh, remind me, I'm going to talk about the biggest indicator that I've I've experienced, that I now look for, uh, the character trait to differentiate someone you can trust and someone you cannot, okay? So anyway, go, coming back. So love bombing. Then devalue. So now they've taken you off the pedestal. And now they're like, oh, Tanzim, why'd you do your hair like that? Tanzim, why do you have like these Islamic arts in your room? Like, I don't like it. Maybe you should change it and put something else. Or why are you wearing that shirt? I don't like that shirt. Like, you look better in this other shirt. You know, they start devaluing. Like, they, they're not, you're not. They're not loving you for who you are, right? Or, or if you're in an organization, you know, they start devaluing you. Like if you're working with them, you know, um, you're suddenly off that pedestal and now they just see you as, you know, someone that they can control or whatever. Um, and then the discard phase is, you know, I don't need you. And they just totally like, you know, and then you're left, you know, the victim is like left like, no, but you, you were so nice in the beginning. And this is where that trauma bond comes back. And then, you know, it, it, it's just a cycle. You know, it, it continues until the victim, the victim has to discard the narcissist. The victim has to cut ties. They have to go no contact. They have to gray rock. Gray rock is where you become an emotionless, non-reactive rock to boring to the narcissist. Don't give them any reaction or response, you know, when they're trying to evoke uh, emotion out of you because they will hoover, they will try to do everything to get you back into the ring pen and you don't want to, as Ross Rosenberg said, you don't want to wrestle with the pig, you know? So, so you have to just, just ignore them, go no contact, block them everywhere, you know? Um, so I, I coach a lot of women on that who are, you know, with narcissists and, you know, trying to get out of abusive marriages and stuff. Um, so, so coming back to that, I was going to say there's one character trait. So I've done a lot of like, you know, I am, I've realized why this, I, and to me it's happened male and female. I've had male and female narcissists in my life. And I finally had to do, you know, what's called muhasaba. I had to self-reflect and say, what is it about me that keeps attracting these kinds of people? Like, why does this keep happening to me? What am I doing wrong? And that's how I kind of had that um, eye-opening experience that, oh, I'm codependent. Oh, I am too, I have, la I lack boundaries. Um, I'm too nice. I'm too, you know, I need to be more assertive and I need to, you know, uh, cut people off if they're, if I see signs of abuse. So the number one sign that I now look back at all these people who, in my life who exhibited these types of um, behaviors, betrayal or whatever, uh, they all had um, some form of lying or deception. 
And when you think about the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, before he became the Prophet, or uh, sorry, he was always a Prophet, but you know what I mean, before he got what he, at age 40, um, he was known as Alamina Sadiq, the, the trustworthy one, the truthful one, right? And this is the, the biggest thing that I now sit back and watch for. And if I see any form of lying or deception, I, I, I have to keep a distance because that, that lying and deception will, will affect me at some point, you know, down the line if I don't keep a distance. So, um, yeah, it's, and, and, I and to, uh, quickly yeah. ask as well. Yeah. I, w- I want to quickly ask as well, just um, on, because mashallah, like you really broke it down really well. And I think the listeners really have grasped, um, I, I don't want to speak in behalf of the listeners, but I've certainly grasped like in the sense of how you broke it down. But I also wanted to ask like maybe um, rewinding a bit and going to what we were touching on now. Like for example, you're, you're, uh, you're talking about in the talking stages about like love bombing, gift giving. Mm-hmm. that specific uh situation that narcissists do yeah that reminds me of uh they it's it's almost like they're appealing to uh the love languages love languages being like you know words of affirmation mm-hmm. gift giving as a way to show your love mm-hmm. and so they go to sort of extreme uh extents to do all of that to as yes. if suck you in to like suck you into that kind of you know you know that the 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 sort of way of thinking of of uh, perceiving them to be oh look at him mashallah like you know he's such a great guy look at him he gave me all these gifts because to your from he, from that kind of victim's own perspective they see love through gift giving right mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and so the narcissist will kind of use that to their advantage right early on mm-hmm, so they'll mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know go down that route so uh, not just with gift giving there's with words of affirmation as well it's like so much praise it's like oh wow like oh my god like you know it's maybe they've never really had someone that's really praised them to that degree um, in their life because maybe, you know, the situation of the family is not the best, etc. So it's like, wow, like this guy actually is praising me for who I am. Like, wow, that, that makes me feel really good. And so you're automatically like sort of, you know, sucked into that um, way of thinking of, you know, really appreciating putting them on a pedestal because they're appreciating you so much. Um, so there's that angle. And just to add as well, um, I also wanted to touch on what you said in terms of wanting to quickly get married, like the narcissists who want to, you know, quickly get married. I wanted to ask you just as a question with that, would you say that, why would you say that's the, that's the reason? Would you say that the reason is, is because you don't, that doesn't give much time for the victim to think much. And because they are already in good terms with the narcissist, they are just going to think, okay, yeah, like he's great to me, like, and he's not giving me much time to think about it. So I'll just, say yeah like is that the kind of intent like how would you kind of break it down like what's the why is the narcissist like that like quick to get married in that i mean that's exactly it they need to trap their victim they don't want the person to see so so narcissists have what's called a false self and they're wearing a mask right they're false this is their false self that they're uh projecting is oh i'm an upstanding uh community member I am running this Muslim organization. I'm very religious. I pray. I do all this stuff. Um, I'm kind. I'm. I'm. You know that. The, but they can't keep it up for too long, right? That it's hard for them to keep that up. They know that at some point someone's going to see who they really are, right? And so they need to trap their victim very quickly before the, the the victim you know wises up and sees them their true colors you know so yeah it's it's all part of the manipulation now so i do some talks on in clubhouse and i, I and i tell people so i've read a lot of, on manipulation and and manipulation in you know uh dating and whatnot as well and subhanallah i i myself you know have run into someone who exhibited all three of these these three major red flags within a 48 hour period so the three major red flags again in the love bombing stage um is number one the 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 over flattery and praise right Oh my God, you're so beautiful. You're so amazing. I never met anybody. You're my soulmate. Oh my, how are you my, 
like we we just met you know how can you say that you know um things like that like oh it's you're just they mirror you a lot they'll try to oh we're so alike oh i like that too me too you know so the mirroring happens um number two is future faking uh oh we'll get married we'll live together we'll move here we'll do this together oh you want to travel i'll take you to this restaurant i'll take you on cruises I, i've had this happen right uh i'll and 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 when you are uh a, a, an educated empath you know or codependent and you have worked on yourself and your self-esteem and your self-worth these things won't work you know when someone's telling oh my god you're so beautiful you're so amazing you say, thank you yes i am alhamdulillah you know before you might if you have low self-esteem you're like oh my god they think i'm i'm beautiful oh my god they think i'm amazing like i i feel so seen like wow you know like but when you know who you are okay yeah i am yeah thanks <laughs> yeah. um number two the, the the whole uh future faking you know so i had someone telling me oh i'll take you on cruises i'll take you to michelin star restaurants and i was like i was like yeah married or not you know i should add that to my bucket list you know i should definitely go myself on a cruise i should go and they so they saw it wasn't working you know their future faking wasn't going to work on me. And then a uh, third thing that they do is pity ploys and sob stories. So they're trying to emotionally manipulate you. Um, oh, my my ex, you know, did this, or I was bullied as a child, or I was traumatized as a child, and oh, poor me, or, or my ex was so crazy, my ex cheated on me, or my ex uh, abused me, and, you know, it's too much early on in a rela new relationship to be sharing these kinds of traumas and whatever, but they're trying to hook you in uh, quickly with, uh, they, they want to, as I said, they, they prey on caretaker, uh, empath, codependent types, you know, that's their, that's their, their best, you know, type of victim. Um, is someone who's going to caretake them that so so this world is um, full of givers and takers right and what is narcissism narcissism is power and control and take 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 right and and, and again it's on a spectrum you'll see um, I've seen covert narcissists who are, are very giving uh, you know they are they they try their best to be empathetic and they try to they help around the house you know they might be like that but it's self-serving as well you know as part of their facade you know that oh I'm a nice person I'm a you know whatever so but I've seen the extreme where they're complete takers they never lift a finger they don't help with anything you know and and so there's a book by Dr. Ross Rosenberg it's called uh, the human magnet syndrome and um what he does is he he basically puts codependency and narcissism like on a spectrum from negative five to positive five and what he so so, so a negative five codependent is an extreme giver and they have completely lack boundaries and they just give 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 and they lose their sense of self and they're just other focused and whatever right and then that positive five narcissist is an extreme pathological narcissist extreme taker uh you know and then there's fours and then threes and then zeros and ones i believe maybe twos even i forget are more healthy people so so it's all on the spectrum right so, so once you get to the middle, the one, there's no one who's really a zero, but the ones and twos, they're able to give and take in the relationship in a healthy way. But when you have these polar opposites, you know, so a, a, a positive five codependent will be attracted to a negative five narcissist. And what happens is, if there's an imbalance so if let's say the codependent person starts waking up and saying hey wait a second i have no rights like you're taking all my resources you're taking my love you're taking my money you're taking my my care my kindness da, da, and you're you're not giving me love you're not giving me care kindness money da, 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 whatever my rights in a relationship they start shifting to start demanding some of their rights, so they might become a four or a three, but this narcissist is still a five. 
if they're not willing to shift and change their behaviors and start giving a little bit, there's going to be a break in the relationship. There's going to be a rupture. And either the, the relationship either ends or they go for marital counseling or whatnot, right? So, so there is, if you're a codependent person, you have to do the work on learning to set boundaries, to assert yourself, to speak up for yourself, your rights, uh, work on your self-esteem, your self-worth. Um, I tell women who are coming out of these abusive marriages, um, you know, a lot of times these uh, narcissists, they they are very um, abusive and, and um, verbally and emotionally, and um, they kind of, uh, uh, you know, project on the person's self-esteem and self-worth based on things that, you know, um, like maybe they're not very smart or they don't work, or maybe they're not very attractive or, uh, or maybe they are attractive, but there's something they know, like, um, let's say, um, let's say I'm very self-conscious about my nose or something, right? So they know that you have like, uh, this is your weak point. So they'll always like bring up like, oh, your nose is like that, whatever. They'll try to find something to, you know, make you feel insecure, right? So what I tell uh, these women who are coming out of these um, abusive uh, situations is to work on their self-esteem. And I say, I say, look at your self-worth in the eyes of Allah. I say, you know, you're honest. Was he honest? But you're honest. He can't take that away from you. You're loving. Was he loving? No, but no one can take your loving nature from you. You're, you're, uh, supportive. You're loyal. You're, um, responsible. You're hardworking. You're, um, you strive to please Allah. You, you know, all these core, uh, characteristics about you that make you who you are on the inside. Your external has is beautiful as well, um, but work on the things that who you are as a person in the eyes of Allah, and that is where our worth, our self worth comes from. There's a beautiful book that I recommend um, to a lot of people. It's called Secrets of Divine Love. I'll show you. It's called Secrets of Divine Love, and I recommend this to everybody. It is. It does have uh, probably um, some Sufi-ish strains to it, but there's a chapter in this book called "Who Are You," and it is so. This book is so beautifully written. It really attaches your heart to Allah. It makes it makes you realize that you, just the fact that Allah created you, you matter. That gives you your own self worth. You know that the fact that Allah even thought I should, I, I needed to be on this earth is because I matter and I am important and I, I have a purpose and, and it's just so beautifully written. And, and so I, a lot of, um, yeah, my work is also, you know, helping women, um, build their self esteem, self-worth. And, and so when you have a good sense of self, you're able to ward off all these manipulation tactics of the narcissist. And you're able to see the red flags and set the boundaries. You know, um, there was one, uh, person, um, that I came across, um, and, you know, they, so one of the, and I read this in the book, one of the manipulation tactics, they, this person would say, you know, oh, I don't see gender. I, I, you know, I don't see a sister as a sister. You know, I don't, um, I, I don't see gender. I just see people as humans. And I love everybody. I love you for the sake of Allah. And I don't think there's anything wrong with me saying that. I love you. Okay, so I'm, the manipulation behind that is they know that the words I love you is going to instill, uh, is going to give you some feelings. You know, wow, this person loves me. Even if they say, I love you for the sake of love, they, they, this is a deep emotion of love. And, and, and it's inappropriate. It's inappropriate to be saying to someone, an unmarried person, 
uh, to be saying to another unmarried person uh, if they're not pursuing you, if they're not being clear, you know, and pursuing you for marriage. I mean, this is it's just, you know, they're not going through the proper channels, talking to your wali. You know, these are things that should not be said. Now, I'm telling, now I, I hope some of your listeners aren't like, oh, take notes. This is what I should do to hook a girl in. Like, no, please don't do this. This is wrong. <laughs> um, it, and it goes both ways. As I said, women can use the same manipulation tactics on men, you know, and say, oh, you're my soulmate. Oh, you, it, but again, it's not always narcissism. You know, some, some, uh, there's also attachment issues, anxious attachment issues. There's people who are codependents can also kind of have like this fantasy thinking. So, so when the, the narcissist is doing that future faking, the, the codependent can go into this fantasy like, Oh, wow, my life is going to be so great with this person. And so they're trying to feed onto that, um, aspect of a codependent's mind of, of living happily ever after. You know, and, and and in our community, I mean, oh my goodness, the they the Daisy community, the Indo Indo Pak community, you know, they teach our daughters, um, oh, marriage is going to be like a Bollywood movie. You know, you you can't do anything while you're in under our roof, but once you get married, you can go to the movies, you can enjoy life with your husband. You know, it's going to be a, a fairy tale, and in these girls get married and it's a rude awakening because it's anything, you know, but, 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 but we're selling the, these girls, this dream that, you know, life is going to be, um, yeah, you know, a bed of roses and it's not, that's not reality. So. I, I wanted to ask um, as well um, in regards to just uh, what you said earlier, like even uh, with negativity, in the sense of even my personal experience, it has been that I've had friends that are re weirdly very, very vicious and negative in, for example, moments that you may have not done well. So like, I guess it's also just a reminder to make sure you have friends that are supportive because a true friend, if you're going through, you know, a tough time or you may not have, I don't know, it could be, I don't know, you may not be doing a well at uni or you didn't get the job you wanted, etc. You don't, want like friends that are you know negative and always want to point out you know negative things uh mo in moments where you're not doing well like you want like supportive friends right and so i think not like i even in my sort of personal life there have been instances where it's like hey this person isn't as supportive like why is this guy like attacking me when i'm down right and so you know it's it's important to realize like you know having those supportive network and a supportive friends really helps as well and um remember uh, so I was talking about, um, so essentially narcissists cutting off your, uh, so th the narcissist and the victim, that dynamic, the narcissist in, in a spousal relationship, the narcissist may, uh, force the victim to lose in touch or, um, keep distant from their friend circles so that the supply is like only the narcissist and it's like the lifeline. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so you'll see that in a lot of so let's say um, a woman gets married into a narcissistic family system, right? So what you might find, and, and, and it happens a lot in, in our culture because a lot of times women uh, get married and leave their own family. They might move to a different state. They might move to a different country. So they're already isolated away from their families to begin with. And then they join this narcissistic family system. And that narcissistic family, not only their spouse who may be narcissistic, but the, the family keeps them enmeshed and isolated. And, you know, like where you don't need friends, you know, we're your friends. We're they, yes, they want to be your, like you said, the lifeline for that victim. They don't want the victim to have uh, outside people who could advise them and tell them like this isn't normal this isn't sound right you know and, and you know give them the support that they need so yeah definitely and, and and it doesn't even have to be narcissistic it just abusers in general tend to isolate their victims and and 
they start degrading your friends, you know, oh, you know, people who you trusted and had in your life for years, the narcissist will start devaluing, you know, your friends and your support system and be, and make you question, uh, you know, again, gaslight you and kind of question like, oh, you, no, your friend doesn't really, they're jealous of you or they, they don't really care about you or see how they did that. Oh, see, so, and then manipulate you so that you kind of isolate yourself, you know, from that support system as well. So definitely that happens. And just to add as well, essentially going back to that whole idea, I think we, we were discussing a bit earlier <laughs> In, in the sense of, you know, they have that kind of initial phase of gift giving and, and love bombing. And what happens is all these kind of situations rise up later where, you know, as you just articulated beautifully about they are degrading your friends, you're, uh, they're degrading you, making you feel worthless, etc. There's that kind of phase as well, slowly and surely. Um, <coughs> you know, they have the power and the control. And so in that situation, just to describe, I guess what happens is they get, the, the 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 victim gets sucked in too hard into the, the 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 relationship and thinking the best about the narcissist because they're always falling back to oh my gosh like they were so good to me at the beginning what happened it's almost like they are ha- they they're, they're hopeful that they'll return back to that kind of you know oh you know they're so good to me then and they promised me all these things and they used to love on me and give me gifts etc cetera, etc cetera. and so it's almost that cycle and I guess sometimes uh, what happens in a situation where the friends get cut off. It's like the friends are noticing like weird things as well. And um, within that, it's like, you don't even trust your friends anymore. Or you, you don't believe your friends. Like, no, like I know he'll be, you know, he, he, he's a good person at heart. He'll return to his ways. So there's that kind of, kind of weird dynamic. So once you kind of cut off the friends completely, it's like, you're always stuck in that cycle of always thinking of when uh, the, the narcissist was good. And it's like, you know, they're only acting bad to me now, but they always return back. And it's almost that kind of ebb and flow. And it becomes yeah. really hard when you're sucked in. It's like to get out of that kind of situation and mindset as well. It's like really difficult. But yeah, I just wanted to kind of lay that out in that sort of dynamic as well. Yeah, no, for sure. There's That's one thing, you know, to look out for is, you know, highs and lows in the relationship, you know, volatility. Um, um, intensity, you know, any, any relationship that starts out very intense is also going to end just as fast as it started. It's going to end very quickly as well. You know? Um, yeah. And you see, you'll see, you know, that the narcissist will, you know, go through people very quickly. You know, they'll, they'll jump relationship to, to relationship. You, one relationship won't even end yet and they'll already be looking for next supply because it it they have such a deep void within them that needs to be satiated you know that that validation that they have this deep like a uh, yeah void and hollowness and um, emptiness that needs to be filled, you know, uh, quickly because they can't live in that pain of uh, not, they themselves have low self-esteem. They themselves feel unworthy and unlovable and lonely and whatever. And they also fear abandonment. It's really interesting, you know, they, they also fear abandonment, but then they instill fear of abandonment in their victims, you know, um, so it's just, yeah, the whole dynamic is very uh, fascinating. But, uh, yeah, it's to protect yourself, as I said, you have to keep your support systems, keep your boundaries, um, pace the relationship, you know, don't talk to them every day, um, all day, every day. Uh, I know, and it was, the, the thing is, is that, um, so, okay, let's, let's talk about attachment trauma. Okay. So there's something called attachment theory and, um, there's four, four types of attachments. There's secure attachment. So you're just a secure person, healthy relationships. Um, you're not jealous. You're, you're just totally secure. You're not anxious in the relationship. You're not fearing abandonment. You just 
or normal, healthy, secure person because you had your needs met as a child from your parents, right? So you're so you grew up in a secure environment and and um, you're able to be secure in relationships. Uh, but then there's three kinds of insecure attachment styles that develop from childhood, you know, in the first, you know, seven years of life, maybe five years of life. And those are dismissive avoidant, uh, anxious preoccupied, and fearful avoidant. So uh, I, I find that narcissists, in my experience, uh, I guess they could be any, but I've seen them very dismissive avoidant. Um, that's where they lack empathy. You see them, they're dismissive. They, 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 they're very cold. They kind of show that they don't care about you. They're willing to walk away from you. Um, or I've also seen them um, as a uh, fearful avoidant. And um, so someone who's fearful avoidant, um, they, they're, they also fear abandonment. They fear rejection. They have low self-esteem. Um, and so they might push you away in the relationship because they're afraid that you're going to reject them. So they'll reject you before you reject them. And someone who has anxious preoccupied, uh, that person also has um, fears of abandonment, fears of rejection, but they are very clingy and needy in the relationship. So, so when we talk about um, like marriage counseling, what you'll see is the avoidant and the anxious are are usually uh, polarized and they're very attracted to each other. So, so you've got a runner and a chaser, right? So the anxious is chasing the avoidant person. The avoidant person is trying to get away, and then once the 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 anxious person um, starts feeling like abandoned or rejected, they start pulling away and then the avoidance starts chasing them. And they just stay in this cycle of chasing and running and, you know, avoiding and whatever. And, and it's very unhealthy. Um, so, so narcissists, you know, they have their own trauma from their childhood and um, someone who's codependent may have their own trauma as well. And they lack that self-esteem, self-worth, um, you know, a sense of self, uh, and both of them do. And uh, that's why this dynamic, you know, happens where they're attracted to each other and they get sucked into these dysfunctional um, cycles. And, and, and again, as I said in the very beginning, and the, this perpetuates that intergenerational trauma, these children are growing up in dysfunctional um, uh, households and then they grow up and they have a high tolerance for chaos and dysfunction and they find someone else who might have grown up in a chaotic dysfunctional household and they say oh I can relate to you and then they continue the cycle of dysfunction and chaos you know it doesn't have to be narcissistic I'm just talking about anything that's dysfunctional so um, it's really important to now, you know, in our community, we also try to uh, encourage our youth to get married young. Uh, I myself was very young, you know, when I was married, I was 19, and I was coming out of one dysfunction, dysfunctional situation with my mom being sick, my parents being divorced, whatever. I didn't take the time to learn who I was, to work on myself, to work through my own process, my own traumas and whatever. And and jumped into a marriage without knowing what was healthy and what was unhealthy. So I, I think it's very, very important that we educate our youth on what a healthy relationship should look like, what dynamic is, how to set boundaries, what is normal. If, if someone is crossing boundaries, you know, a lot of times I hear these women, uh, girls tell me, you know, that um, they're, they're talking to a brother for marriage, right? And everything seems good. Parents are involved, whatever, and they're in, they start to, you know, develop feelings for this person. And, and the brother starts pushing boundaries, you know, and, and this is where we have the, the fear of the law has to come in. You know, if someone is 
is trying to sell you that they are God-fearing, that they're religious. They care for their akhirah and they should be caring for your akhirah. And they should not be doing anything to, uh, you know, cross boundaries and um, uh, kind of um, mess up your your path to Allah. And so, you know, they'll they'll start, you know, with romantic, you know, the, maybe the I love you, you're my soulmate, whatever. And then they start, you know, oh, you look so nice. Oh, you you look so beautiful. Oh, um, I don't know. I'm just, you know, maybe talking about physical attributes, you know, and the girl, especially if she's young, I would say, you know, and, and the other issue is we, we raise our daughters to be people pleasers and kind and we shouldn't make other people uncomfortable. But if you're feeling this is where your gut needs to come in and if someone is making you feel uncomfortable, you know, and they're, they're, you know, talking to you in a very um, inappropriate manner. We need to teach our daughters to stand up and say, you know, I don't feel comfortable with you talking to me like this. You know, I fear Allah. Like, and, and, and we're human too. We're, girls are human too. We have feelings, you know, whatever. And um, a, a, a man, a, a God-fearing Muslim man will know that a woman's heart is very delicate and fragile and, and we do have a lot of love to give and he would protect that and he would be very wise with his words and careful what he says so as not, not to put a woman in a position where she is compromising her fear of Allah, you know, for pleasing this man you know, who is trying to get her something from her. You know, a lot of, you know, the, we we say, you know, a man, you know, is attracted to a woman and and wants, you know, to ha be intimate with her or whatever. And, and if they're not married yet, you know, he should not be talking in this manner, knowing that soon they will be married. And, and, and at that point, these kinds of discussions uh will be permissible and halal for them and he should protect that that honor and so the gift giving and all of that stuff um i would say uh should should not happen until after the marriage um just to protect uh each other you know some i've heard of women sending gifts too you know and um that should all, until the nikah, until the families are involved and there's a nikah and everything, you know, everything's set, you're close, you know, then gift giving should not happen prior to that just because it's very manipulative, you know, no way. And we just need to be careful. I wanted to, I wanted to uh, ask as well, I, I wanted to uh, touch as well on what you said earlier about, um, about the dynamics of, you know, for example, the person that may be in perhaps a dysfunctional family and then move into uh, a marriage and they don't know themselves and you know they're sort of navigating life and you know quickly moving into a marriage and you know it becomes maybe a, a way that the narcissist can take control of that person is because you know they're a bit more vulnerable they don't know about themselves etc so they're easily to um easier to manipulate in that even situation like it reminds me of um it was Gary Chapman in uh, the book, the, the Five Love Languages. He actually mm -hmm. touches on a really important point about, he, he gives a good analogy about the love tank, right? So the love tank is this, you know how you, we have like cars, like fuel tanks? Yeah. Let's just imagine there's like a love tank, right? And so, yeah. you know, we were talking about dependent and codependency, um, parenting styles, for example, or if when it comes to the ch uh, child, sometimes if the child is in a dis dysfunctional family and they may be codependent, but the the parent wasn't you know too nice to them and was very manipulative and controlling etc it's like the love tank is going to be low right because for them essentially what happens is the way they you know really feel loved and the way that they see love is through for example through words of affirmation right like that's the way uh you know positive reinforcement like okay wow yeah. son you're doing a great job like oh wow son like this is amazing work oh wow son like you know you did really well in in sports today you know good job but like sometimes when you're in a very negative kind of household and a negative 
frame of mind of perhaps it could be parents it always like criticizing always belittling you it could be like the kind of odd odd one out in the family because you know you don't yeah. have certain skills that maybe they're always comparing you to other kids etc so like in that dynamic it's so detrimental for that child when it comes to um getting that love that they need because they in order to because it's part of the nature right it's part of the nature to see love in that manner and so once they don't uh perhaps get it in the way that they perceive it because gary chapman kind of uses a good analogy he kind of says like um between people like if it comes to perceiving love let's just say you know i know chinese and you know uh i don't know japanese right and so if i speak in chinese you're not going to understand me if you only know japanese right we need to speak mm -hmm. in the same sort of language in the same right. wavelength to really understand each other right and so within that dynamic sometimes when it comes to love um it can be you know you're speaking in you're, you're trying to say you love i love you i don't know for example in, in chinese it's like it's not coming across because the other guy only understands like japanese right and so you need to make sure that in order to see love you need to see it from the same wavelengths and from the same understanding so that's kind of ties into why the love language is important is because you can start like okay look this person is only seeing love through gift giving and so if they weren't given that as a young child it's like they've perceived the whole life thinking you know that the love tank is low it's like you know i didn't get the love that i needed because it's part of my psyche to see love in that manner right and so it kind of ties into making sure with, when it comes to parenting styles that we are giving love to our child in the way that they perceive love to be um and it, it could vary it could be you know words of affirmation to gift giving etc and so when you do that the love tank increases right and so when it comes to for example they've have they had that love because of that fostering loving kind family that they're from you know it'll be a bit easier and better to navigate situations for example when it becomes when it comes to marriage because they're not seeking what they didn't have from family from that spouse where they may be vulnerable right and so within that it's like okay when your love tank is full and going into a marriage you're not going to be vulnerable right you know you're not going to seek that kind of exactly. emptiness from your spouse that you didn't get from your family so you know it's really important for that person to be self-aware in that sense and so yeah like it's really important like at the end of the day what, how we're speaking about it's just bringing that information to the people and really unpacking it so they're just self-aware it's like okay i need to make sure like what am i susceptible to you know what's my um naturally like what am i you know dependent or codependent like uh, how do i act do i see love in this manner and that manner like you need to right. like i guess there needs to be that kind of knowledge of yourself right and i guess this t t this kind of flows into islam deen tazkia sufism whatever you want to call it it's like the knowledge of the self is so important in regards to your relationship with allah right it's yeah. almost like if you know yourself and your instincts and your situations you can kind of navigate life and you know do your, your spiritual practices better etc so it's really important like to have that kind of um grounding in yourself and making sure as you know it's a responsible you know I guess people who are parents to make sure that their kid is and the child um is uh getting the love that they need because like gary chapman gave an example which was really scarring and i think a lot of muslims may you know like for example he, she, he gave an example of um from memory was a really young 12 year old uh female that uh contracted a sexually transmitted disease and you know the the parents were berating her and took her to the council etc you know, she's such a young child what did she do why is she doing this and you know gary chapman was like you know what was the relationship like with you and your daughter and it was obviously dysfunctional it's like that's why she was seeking validation from another guy because another older guy i think like he was 19 or whatever was essentially giving her the the attention that she didn't get from her parents right. or her family and right. so she yeah. naturally gravitated towards that and one thing leads to another it's like okay she goes so if it's like you know how we talked to her right at the beginning of the episode it's like you know on a suicide is haram like only fixating on that is like so like narrow-minded it's like even this like oh yeah zina is haram like you know stuff like yeah i get it right obviously yes like i don't disagree right but it's about unpacking to why it got to that stage right you need to peel back the layers and be like wait did they even get the love that they needed like from, from you know in regards to the love tank um, from their family so it's about really unpacking that and really kind of having those honest conversations it's like you can't just you know, we see certain per parenting styles is very strict to the point, a bit of negative. It's not fostering that loving kind of um, family unit and family relationship. So it's about, you know, fostering that. And it's like, are we doing that? Like, that should be our first step and having a healthy relationship, not just kind of this, you know, you do what I want to, you know, I want you to do and have that dynamic with your kids, right?
right. um, and understanding that. So, yeah, sorry, I know I went in a bit long, no, but no, this just is, kind of to no, add to you, what you're saying. Yeah, no, you brought up some really good points and it, it made me think of some things when it comes to parenting. So, yeah, we, you know, some people ask me, like, how can we prevent our child from becoming a narcissist? And, and yeah, we want to praise our kids, but we don't want to over praise them either. We don't want to call, see, we, one issue is um, we tend to praise our children based on their achievements. You know, oh, uh, you got a good grade, you got a good score, you, you achieved this, you know. But we need to praise our children for their inherent values. You know, the values that Allah uh, tells us, you know, so, oh, you're so honest, you're so giving, you're so compassionate, you're so... These are the things, when a child is exhibiting positive character traits those are those are the areas that we want to praise and and encourage right um if a child is misbehaving if a narcissist a child who's becoming narcissistic you know they're not um you know being loving and caring and whatever but then you're praising them like oh you know i love you i'm gonna do everything for you and they didn't earn it you know um by being a good person, then, then you're just coddling them. And, and I feel like in our Desi culture, a lot of uh, Desi mothers are creating narcissistic sons because they just say, oh, because you're a boy, you know, um, you're just entitled to, you know, be served hand and foot and whatnot. And, then, and this is an issue. Now, the other thing I wanted to talk about is, you know, the relationship between a child male or female and their father and we, you hear the term like daddy issues and of course i i speak a lot from the female perspective because i am a female and i work with that demographic but um but daddy issues i mean boys can have daddy issues too so there's something called the father wound okay and and so i was just uh researching this and so some of the ways a father wound can manifest in a child is they have weak boundaries. You know, they have an inability to say no to people. Um, they seek relationships with partners who have qualities, the same qualities as their father. Um, they, they have codependency because of that they have low self-worth. Um, they have discomfort in displaying their emotions. So again, we need to allow our children to express their emotions male or female that it's okay to cry it's okay to feel sad i understand you're feeling this way this is you know we need to help them process and unpack those emotions um they are unconsciously seeking their father's approval throughout their adult life um, they have a desire to be seen as strong and never as weak uh, they have have hero worship behavior of their father regardless of the painful actions towards towards you that the father did you still see your father as like your hero uh, a lot of times you know there, there's body image issues and um some women have a distrust or anger or rage uh for men so so when you have this father wound um you know, as a female and, and, and then as a codependent in general. So, so Dr. Roz Rosenberg, what he calls codependency actually is the self love deficit disorder. So as you said, your love tank is low because you don't have that self love. So you're seeking it, that validation or whatever you're seeking it from your partner. So there's another author, um, her name is Pia Melody. She wrote a book called Facing Codependence codependency and she wrote this book called facing love addiction so what happens is again you it says giving yourself the power to change the way you love and so what happens with codependency and and when you have these father wounds or whatever as you said you're seeking that love um outside of yourself externally and so what i tell a lot of these women who are uh coming out of these marriages or whatever or even if they're still in the marriage a lot of times i have women who are in the marriage and i say take the focus away from this and, and give yourself that love i'm like you know okay you like gifts he doesn't buy you gifts buy yourself gifts buy yourself flowers you know buy once a week, get yourself roses. Why not? Why do you need somebody else to do that for you? Do it for yourself. Love yourself. And I know this is very foreign in the Muslim community, this concept that feels like psychobabble to them about loving yourself. But it is 
very important. It is so, and, and then the whole self-affirmation, you know, if words of affirmation is your love language because you lack that as a child, do it to yourself. That's what I tell them. Tell, I, I, I tell women to put sticky notes on their mirror and say, you know, I am beautiful. I matter. The world is a better place because I exist. I'm honest. I'm loving. I'm, I, I, you know, all these like positive things because, um, that you need to give it to yourself so that you're not seeking it externally. And again, this is so that you don't attach yourself to someone else. You ta keep yourself attached to yourself and Allah. Keep your, your heart attached to Allah and attached to yourself so that you have a good sense of self so that when something doesn't feel right, you listen to that, you know, listen to that gut instinct again. So words of affirmation, gift giving, there's physical touch, there's acts of service, there's quality time, spend quality time with yourself, be alone, go on a walk alone, go out to dinner alone, go to the movies alone, go on vacation alone, um, acts of service, serve yourself, you know, take care of yourself. Um, so yeah, all of these things, uh, yes, it's nice. And of course, we all want companionship and, and we pray to Allah that, you know, Allah bless us with a spouse who loves us in the way that we need. But don't put all your eggs in that basket and have these expectations because you will always, you're yourself not perfect and you will not be able to meet your, your, partner's expectations and you should not expect that they're always going to meet your expectations either um so find friends you know have different support systems that that fill that love tank in other ways and don't put all that uh i would say you shouldn't put it all now if you have a healthy partner they would want to know what your love language is they will want to you know fulfill you in that way if that makes you happy um but you know if, don't i think uh you're going to disappoint yourself well. yeah uh-huh no, I was just saying, like, you really, like, mashallah, you articulated all those points, like, amazingly, like, just the way that I think it also speaks to that broader idea that, you know, you're talking about self-love. It's just, like, there's so much healing left to do in our Muslim community. And, yeah. like, where can I begin to start? I guess, like, because uh, I have a lot, like, to share, you know, from my own personal experiences and just from friends around me. It's, like, um, you know, this is why I actually enjoy, like, because we've had a lot of, like, these kind of discussions, you know, one-on-one -on -one and, you know, with others as well, between me and you and others. It's, like, it's when, when especially, like, when the Muslim community, for example, like, me as a Bangladeshi um, living uh, in, in, in Australia, Sydney, like, a lot of our parents may have struggled to even get to the West to have a better living because, you know, they were struggling back at home. And in the process, there's a lot of struggle and a lot of uh, pain to do with that, and a lot of pressure because it's like monetarily they have to provide for the rest of the family. And um, I know like with my dad and my mom, they kind of went through that where it's like, because I guess my context is like a lot of my family is still in Bangladesh. Um, some of them are in the States, but like my immediate family, most of them are still in Bangladesh. And so there's always this like, you know, we've kind of came here. We have to make it now, right? Like we have to do something. We have to provide. And um it's really fascinating because I'm doing um, classes um, on like the racial contract and it was, it's it's really fascinating that even these kind of themes is uh, articulated because you know, virtue of us being Muslim and, and people of color, etc., we have, we're always tied down to our community because it always falls back on, you know, how do I provide to my family back home or, you know, how do I, you know, take care of my immediate community, right? Whereas, like, for example, people that have already settled here from years ago, like, you know, it could be, like, white people, etc. cetera, they don't have, they may not have that kind of pressure this way that we do, like, especially my community, Bengali community, this pressure to provide, you know, to our kind of poorer uh, cousins back home, etc. right? Anyway, so, like, my point is more so that when we had that kind of phase of, you know, coming to, to, to my case, Sydney, Australia, having this pressure to work hard and, you know, work on a crazy 12 hour shifts and all that and make money and, and then provide. It's like in that what happens is 
education becomes a priority because you want to like provide the best for your kids and so it's not necessarily about you know catering for their love language it's more about you know study work hard get a job and it's like that's the only focus and that's how they view success like i can't blame them by in saying yeah. that it's just cost a lot of trauma mental health it's um you know ki- uh, i guess what happens when it comes to fatherhood the fathers just only perceive their role to be as breadwinners and providers and they don't i guess realize that they have a sort of responsibility when it comes to taking care of their um uh, emotional needs of their kids and so it's like the fathers they already have this assumption perhaps it's a cultural thing where it's like they're, they're only the breadwinners and that's it whereas um you know the, the the women are just like caring for the emotional needs and that's it and within that it's like a lot of things are missed a lot of you know deeper points about how to take care of people's psychological needs especially the kids are missed and especially the wife as well it's only about making it in the system it's only about providing for our family back home and it's come at the cost with you know a lot of mental cuz like the kids end up growing up and you know as as we just articulated it's like you know they may seek that kind of approval or praise from the spouse and maybe the narcissism happens and the victim you know the, the victim is a victim and gets manipulated etc and the cycle just continues right that that kind of trauma just continues generation after generation so it's like for us i guess as muslims in the community right now and perhaps why like could be a potential reason why suicides are such a um, big issue in the muslim community is like we have to educate ourselves we have to um, be confident in who we are we have to know you know our strengths and uh, as people and have that kind of self confidence in ourselves and really kind of break that trend of okay no i'm not going to continue the cycle of trauma i'm going to stop it right here and you know have that loving house so sorry i know i went on a bit of a ramble but it's just kind of feeding into that broader point about how important our conversation is and seeing it in the bigger scheme of things as well yeah No, I appreciate you. Yeah, there's definitely um that that itself uh for immigrant parents who have moved to western countries and some came as refugees, right? I mean, there's there's definitely immigrants who are refugees and they're they're in survival mode for sure. And and that comes with its own trauma, right? If you're fleeing your country or you're trying to leave um poverty or whatever you've you've experienced trauma now you're trying to start over and and yeah definitely you kind of um uh can can kind of not have a balance because you know islamically we're supposed to have balance in our lives you know um, with their families and with our work and spiritually and sometimes there's an imbalance because we're just in survival mode and we're trying to work and provide um for our family so so yeah no fault we're we're not trying to point fingers at our parents for you know they 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 had their own traumas and what the point is focus on yourself recognize the trauma stop the cycle with you get the healing get the help and and you know continue this self awareness this muhasaba and um and and help your children be better you know versions you know and and educate them on this stuff too you know that we are human and we we are not perfect we weren't given a manual other than the quran on how to live on this earth and uh quran and sunna and so we're going to make mistakes along the way as well and you know to have compassion and understanding and you know uh, but before um you know we wrap up there's a couple things that i wanted to also bring up that are very important when it comes to boundaries and and toxic you know environments abusive environments so i i attended a lecture uh and and we t- the the sheikh touched on these points and you know children sometimes are in abusive homes and they can't get out um and uh you know they're 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 dependent on their parents and they can't get out but we look uh to the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in his example and you know when the muslims were in makka and they were in a state of oppression you know um they were being uh you know whipped or buried in the sand uh you know in the scorching heat you know so many forms of torture 
uh, by the kuffar for becoming Muslim. You know, mostly the the slaves were going Sumayya, Bilal. You know, they were all going through these different forms of torture. And so Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam told the Muslims to migrate first to Abyssinia, and then later they migrate to Medina. You know, to an environment that was healthy, an environment that was not toxic and oppressive, right? Somewhere where they can have safety. So, so going back to domestic abuse victims, you know, um, it's important if, if you're in an environment that's toxic and abusive to get yourself out, not keep yourself, you are doing zulm on yourself by staying in a zulm situation when someone is doing zulm on you and you're choosing to stay you are doing zulm on yourself allah does not want us to oppress ourselves allah wants us to be in a state of healthy environments and positivity so so doing that migration getting out of that situation and having the walk on trusting that allah will provide is so important and then when it comes to boundaries and cutting off ties so as i said the example of a child you know, who's in a oppressive state, you know, they can't do much, but they can try to set boundaries. They, it might not go over well, but um, when you become adults, for example, uh, you are allowed to set boundaries. You don't, yes, you cannot cut off ties of kinship, but from what I've learned from scholars is you, you can set boundaries. You can as long as you're not cutting off the ties, you're still set, saying salam to them, Eid Mubarak to them, you know, whatever the boundary is, you don't have to expose yourself to that oppressor. And when it comes to the rights of parents or the rights of other Muslims, um, the scholar was saying uh, that these rights that Allah lays out in the Quran and Sunnah for the rights of parents is for the, the average, normal, healthy parent. Yes, they deserve these rights. But when a, a parent is is not is abusing their rights and they're abusing you, then they have lost their rights to that respect and all all those other rights that Allah has imposed on a Muslim. So we need to understand that that there are exceptions to what Allah. So when we talk about the spiritual manipulation, like oh you have to obey your parents, you can't say it to your parents. No, but when the parent is being abusive and they're not giving you your your their child their rights then they also give up their rights to the respect and you know it's, it's this is what the scholars have said and uh you know maybe you know your listeners are going to listen and they can they can verify you know what their own scholars um if this if there's truth to this um but um, this is what I've learned. I'm no alama. May Allah forgive me. You know, anything I've said in this talk, you know, is from my own shortcomings, my own mistakes. I'm I'm a student of ilm. I'm a student of this life. I'm a student of psychology. Um, you know, I'm on this path, journey of learning and in disseminating whatever I've learned along the way. I'm trying to uh, share with you all that. You know, whatever is good is from Allah and whatever was wrong is, you know, from my own shortcomings and may Allah forgive me for that. Um, but, um, yeah, I think this is, you know, a good, if you have any other questions, if there's anything else you want to add or ask. Um, yeah. Um, one one thing, because what you just mentioned is all reminds me of the earlier, really earlier point you made about the Munafikin. Uh, it's really fascinating because we like it's very clear from the Sira that the Sahaba actually knew who the Munafikin were, but at the same uh, same breath, it wasn't like they were going out persecuting them or whatever, right? Um, because I guess as Muslims, we just have to go by you know the out you know outward actions, and if they look Muslim, we just kind of you know treat them as such. So, but in saying that, it's like the Sahaba actually knew who the Munafikin were, so it's like in saying that it's really feeds into what we were discussing it's like but they set the boundaries they didn't let them just kind of willy-nilly like enter their kind of inner circles of of, of believers etc it's like they let them be you know and just set that kind of boundary as well so it's important yeah. like it kind of goes back to that that point of you know setting the boundaries and obviously like when it comes to setting boundaries it doesn't mean you just be rude and disrespectful etc um you know it just means that you just do your you kind of 
the basic things you need to do as a Muslim and any Muslim would do to another Muslim, like, you know, give salams, be nice, courteous, uh, courteous when you need to be, right? But it's not like that means that they have to be in every single aspect of your life and all that sort of stuff. So you just kind of draw the line where you where you do it and you just kind of do what you need to do, I guess. So it's kind of, I, yeah. I just wanted to highlight that 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 point as well. And um, I don't think, I don't think we talked about it as much, but um when it comes to narcissists i know you might have to go in a few minutes but um do you have do you have time or how, how much time do you have um not long yeah not too long maybe 15 minutes okay tops yeah that's fine i'll I'll probably wrap up in five then inshallah but also like with, when it comes to narcissists um i think we may have touched it but probably not expanded on it is that they actually like to feed and and make sure they get those kind of important positions in society and that's why a lot of them actually strive to become the kind of top doctor or the top engineer um, even top scholar because it's like they know the prestige and the and the power that comes with it and it's almost like they're fixated on that and i i asked this question to um danish Qasim in a previous episode we did with him um and because he, he's in in checks clothing and he deals with kind of these situations about narcissism in our muslim community and so, like i felt like a bit of you know nervousness asking this because it sound like you know but bad other but because he's talking about his experiences in mauritania and i'm like you know would you say that there's a hot bed of narcissists in mauritania like looking to seek knowledge right because <laughs> it's like some people might be like stuff for a what kind of question is that you know they're they're they're, they're, they're studying for the sake of allah etc and he, you know he he agreed and he even said that his his teachers would warn him about that subhanallah so it, it, it goes to show this this is a problem within our muslim circles muslim communities muslim organizations it's like these people are seeking that kind of power and we just need to be vigilant it kind of goes back to kind of having this sort of knowledge having that idea that look you know these kind of people exist in this manner and we have to be aware like when, once you see the signs and you went through the red flag red flags in that kind of instance as well you know just to be aware and just to you know disseminate that kind of knowledge as well so i think that's really important to be mindful of um because yeah i have also seen it my own sort of experiences and it's tragic like doing this podcast alhamdulillah like i guess i'm not putting down any guests like all well, i guess have been amazing mashallah but i guess when you're in those kind of circles of knowing people and knowing their friends and work you know knowing you know people in the other um, community not p people who've come on our show but it's like you start to realize whoa this is actually a bigger problem than i thought like this is actually yeah. like this guy isn't like this is like really bad this is red flags like i didn't it's something that i didn't recognize before but now it's like the kind of lens you put on now it's like oh man like i need to like i'm actually scared now like subhanallah. yeah but, and we and not only other people but we have to check ourselves right and I, i'll tell you even personally um you know i was just uh, wanted to just be a mom and raise my kids and never wanted attention or anything and and then uh, when i started sima uh subhanallah you know allah is al fatah he's the one who opens doors and he's also there's another name of allah where he's the one who kind of you know gives status and elevates his servants right and um i was really confused you know all the attention you know getting interviewed by major publications in the u.s you know npr um, pbs news hour psychology today i'm this subhanallah i couldn't believe it and, and then i got accepted you know to one of the top universities in the world you know and i couldn't believe it and 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 you know it, and it does um you know and then when i'm making like you know like my bio and my cv my resume you know when i'm giving talks i get asked to give speeches now you know i never i was nobody i was just a, a mom you know doing my finance job and then through sima like it's just subhanallah um but we always have to keep ourselves humble um check ourselves you know we're, we're getting especially in this world of social media so i want to show you this book this book is really awesome it's called the handbook of spiritual medicine by ibn daud and it's so cool. So some of the table contents uh, are talking about how to deal with anger, boasting, arrogance, and pride, envy, falsehood, fantasizing, heedlessness, hatred, mockery. So on this topic of ostentation and showing off, this book is so um, modernized. They even talk about uh, showing off in social media and that the, the, the 
ills of that and how to purify that. You know, so they say, oh, you use social media to post and boast about your latest achievement, forwarding updates, media clips, desperate to establish and maintain your presence. You know, we're seeking validation. So how do we purify that? So this book, when it comes to Islamic psychology, I highly recommend this book so that we can purify ourselves and, and purify our intentions. That's one thing when we pray, when we're in these positions of leadership in the Muslim community, we always need to ask Allah to purify our intentions, make sure we are doing it for the right reasons. Um, you know, and you will get people who will say to you, oh, you're just, you 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 don't really care. You just want to, you just want the attention on you and, and you just want, you know, people, you know, praising you and whatever. And, and you really have to check yourself for sure. Um, so yes, all these things I'm telling you is the signs and symptoms, but, you know, as I said, codependents, you know, they also have an empty love tank like you were talking about. And, and they do seek validation, you know, sometimes from their spell words of affirmation. So, so they have to check themselves and do that muhasaba and, and make sure that they are not fulfilling their nafs, the need of their nafs, um, through um, these kinds of things. I did want to talk, I did, we didn't get to talk about, maybe we have like 10 minutes, but um, I was talking, I, we touched on a little bit. So when we talked about attachment theory and trauma and how it ties to addictions, I, I mentioned, so one thing I noticed in a lot of um, narcissists that I've come across is they had different forms of addictions and um, some are porn addiction, uh, hoarding, um, the narcissist supplies. So they might have an addiction to people and getting that validation, um, smoking, I mean, substance, all kinds of things. And addiction, so, so there's a, a, a doctor named Dr. Uh, Gabor Mate. Uh, and uh, he's based out of Canada, I believe. And he's an addiction specialist. And um, what he says is that, you know, when people have addictions, any form, addictions are not just substance abuse. Addictions can be relationships. Addictions can be religion. Addictions can be so many things that we don't even realize. And um, that addiction comes from a trauma in their attachment as a child. And we have to see what what addiction is to numb pain, right? It's, there, it's a numbing so they don't have to feel the pain. So some people, again, use substances to numb that pain. Some people go to people for that validation to numb that pain. So you have to treat the source of where the attachment trauma occurred in their childhood and heal it from that source. Um, so that, and this is again, the nafs, you know, that we talk about, like, we have to keep that in check and we have to heal it so that we're not getting into these addictive behaviors of seeking validation, seeking um, just any form of, um, of n pain numbing through sources outside of Allah, right? Again, coming back to our attachment to Allah. We have to seek that that healing from Allah, not from this dunya, things of this dunya. So that's it on that. <laughs> thank, thank, thank you for that. Yeah, and uh, just to add as well before we wrap, I know you need to head off now, but just to add as well, like you made a brilliant point about you know making sure we, we check ourselves, and you know I'm gonna definitely get that book. Like that seems like a cracking yeah. book. I'm definitely awesome. literally gonna order it after we finish this. But uh, yeah, like even just to add as well from my sort of studies with Maori's Hark and the four temperaments, etc. Like we go through balancing ourselves. So like you know you have the water temperament more prone, to, uh, uh, you know, struggling with you know courage building. So it becomes you know for them you know you have you have to learn to you know kind of build courage to kind of balance themselves. And there's a the sanguine, for example, you know, building that wisdom um, for the melancholy to build um, you know, aspects of, of sociability, etc. Um, and each each temperament is susceptible to you know certain ill uh, not I wouldn't call it ill sorry but susceptible to like anxiety anger 
um, depression. So it's about being self-aware and then working accordingly, right? Because each yeah. temperament will be susceptible to a certain thing like obsession for the sanguine. And so, you know, once you can identify that and understand yourself, you're able to, you know, really truly understand yourself to such like a degree in a deep manner where it's like you can then, you know, be a better version of yourself and be good to others and really understand people for who they are and really be, um, a, you know, what Allah expects us, expects us to be in this dunya in terms of our responsibility here in, uh, in, the, in, in this dunya. So, you know, it's really, I guess it's just to circle it back to just balancing ourselves, knowing who we are, what we need to work on, what, yep. you know, what, what places in our, in our lives that we grew up, like we didn't have and to make sure we, we, we recognize that not like latching onto other, Know, quickly getting married to kind of fill that void etc like kind of identifying that aspect of yourself and you know we talked about healing we talked about you know words of affirmation you said it beautifully like buying yourself gifts etc so it's, it's uh, like we can literally go on for like another two hours yeah. but basically it's you know it comes down to like so much of like healing and understanding yourself so much to that and you know it's been real, like a real honor to like talk with you and you know i, I call you like a dear friend of mine because like you know, we've talked a lot about these kinds of topics and you know we go way back as well mashallah so it was an honor to have you um, on the yeah, show so discussing this and uh looking forward to, to you know, see seeing what you come up with as well in the future and you're know, really exciting the, the direction that you you've sort of taken um as well with this sort of work mashallah so thank Allah. you thank you for accept, accept. yeah jazakallah khair it's, it's been an honor to be here to be a guest you know i i we met, I don't know how many years ago, maybe three years ago or so. And, um, you guys were just starting brand new baby boys in the cave. Yeah. <laughs> and you guys have come so far. <laughs> <laughs> Mashallah. Yeah. And it's been an, uh, a just a pleasure to watch boys in the cave grow and, and now to be a guest on your show is such an honor. And, um, yeah, Jazakallah khair. And yeah, I want to mention that, you know, I did, I have started my own website um, because I, I'm part of so many different organizations and um, I have so many resources to share. Inshallah, um, I hope to be able to provide maybe coaching services at some point. I'm not doing it yet, but if anyone's interested in like the resources that I share, the books that I've shared, um, you can go to my personal website, which is Noreen sahmed.com uh so the spelling will be my name with s for sam as the middle initial um and from there you can see my book club a lot of these books that i mentioned um you can go to resources i share a lot of resources on the psychology attachment theory narcissism codependency a, a lot of these issues that we talked about um you can find those resources um that those all link to my sema facebook album so you can see all those there and um and yeah and if anyone wants to get in touch um just reach out there or on social media and uh yeah love to hear from people and help you know that's that's my purpose i i, I realize this allah's put me on this earth to um educate and support uh our muslims our muslim community and um help them heal you know and provide the resources because you don't know what you don't know i was sleepwalking through most of my life because i didn't know anything mm. i wanted nothing to do with mental health or psychology and subhanallah through sema it's just been a world of wealth of knowledge and islamic psychology is very fascinating so whatever i can do to um, disseminate that knowledge to our community that's what i'm here to do so just talk about that yeah subhanallah subhanallah like you know you don't know what you don't like i'm exactly the same thing like when i got into this kind of stuff and reading it even bouncing off you like there's so much that it's just like whoa like you know where are we as a community we have so much work left to do but inshallah you know with your works i'll pull the links to your you know kind of uh, works in your, in your show notes and your websites etc but you know it's a real honor having you here i'll probably wrap it up there so for our listeners you know thank you for giving us your attention and if you have any questions or queries feel free to email us at info boys in the you can follow us on facebook social media instagram twitter you know much lower growing there so you can give us a follow there give us a five star rating on itunes as that greatly helps us so for my special guest noreen ahmed and myself tanzam we wish you the best this is tanzam 
Okay, that was weird. I made myself twice. But anyways, we're Tanzim. I'm Tanzim, <laughs> signing you off. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs>